I'm joined today by uh, Richard McMeekin, a partner in my old law firm, Morton Fraser. Um, and importantly, for our purposes, uh, Richard is the partner with responsibility for anti-money laundering compliance. So welcome, Richard. Um, Morning, Gordon. For anyone unfamiliar with Morton Fraser, perhaps you could provide us with a, a brief overview of the firm and, and, and your own role in the firm. Yes, of course. So Morton Fraser is a leading um, independent Scottish law firm. We have 43 partners and uh, around 200 to 250 staff. Um, we're based in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and, and we, we're, we're a full service law firm. We have um, four divisions, our corporate team, commercial real estate and infrastructure, private client and, and litigation team. And I'm a partner in the litigation team specializing primarily in commercial litigation, uh, professional negligence or liability claims and insolvency work. Um, but one of the roles that I have at the firm, as, as you say, is as money laundering reporting officer. So I'm responsible for the firm's compliance with the, the anti-money laundering regulations and the proceeds of Crime Act. And in, in terms of Morton Fraser, I, I'm right in thinking that you have a mix actually of Scottish and English qualified solicitors, although your offices are in Scotland. Is that right? Yes, we do. We, we have um, in the litigation team, I'm qualified in England as, as well as in Scotland. I don't practice in England, but we have English qualified litigators. Um, we practice more in, across the border in other areas of the firm. So for example, in, in our family law team, we, we do a lot of work um, both north and south of the border. Commercial real estate, we do the same. Um, and there's, there's obviously areas of practice such as insolvency, um, which I'm involved in, which is, or, or company law, which is largely the same throughout the UK. So um, while we do practice primarily in Scotland, it's a UK wide practice with UK wide clients and and um, you know the the depending on the kind of work we do we spend more or less time south of the border. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to uh, the specifics of money laundering. Um, maybe we could kick off by looking at the kinds of ways that if you are a criminal, if you're a terrorist, how would you use a law firm? to launder money what are the things that you're looking out for richard well i think that i think that the legal profession is in in the first case particularly susceptible to um uh, to money launderers and the law society highlight a few specific um areas where we really need to be uh, vigilant one is um the provision of of company services um, and by that, I mean providing registered office services or company secretarial services for um, for individuals either in, in this country or abroad. Um, obviously, if you're deciding to launder money, then one very good way of doing that is to to set up a, a shell company of some sort, either a, um, or, a, or a trust, indeed, a trust services or another um, another thing to look out for. And in Scotland, in particular, we have Scottish Limited Partnerships, which is a um, uh, uh, for those um, south of the border is a, is a kind of legal entity which is um, you, you can virtually find out nothing about. Um, mm -hmm. At one point, in fact, Scottish Limited Partnerships, I think, were, were actually marketed in places in Eastern Europe as being a good way of hiding um, your money or, 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 or dealing with your business in a way which made it very difficult for authorities to find out anything about um, what you were doing. So we really need to be quite careful if we're setting up, if, if we're asked to set up companies for um, third parties who we don't know um, and, and indeed provide registered office services for, for companies where we don't know the individuals behind the company. So we do a lot of due diligence in relation to, to these sort of things. And it's these sort of areas where we, we, we think there's a, a really high risk. Um, combined with that is, is using our firm's client account as a bank. Mm. Um, you know, you will often have requests from third parties or clients to, uh, to say, well, I know you've not been involved in this transaction, or I know you've not been involved in, in this deal, but this is, this is a situation and we need the money to come through, a, or the other side are asking the money to come through a lawyer's bank account before um, on completion. Um, the answer to that is no. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it, but it is, I think, very common for solicitors, both in Scotland and in England and Wales, to be to be asked to provide that sort of banking 
facility almost. So the use of our client account as a bank is a, a big no-no, but it's something that I think solicitors really have to be careful of because um, if they are you know, dealing with an investment transaction, for example, they're being asked to accept money from 20, 30 different investors, you really need to know where that money's coming from and who these people are. Um, and if you don't know that and the money's coming through your bank account, then that's where you're going to get into to difficulty. So um, what we need to be careful of there, um, as in a lot of areas of money laundering, is facilitating, not being deliberately involved in, in criminal transactions, but inadvertently facilitating criminal transactions just by being a bit too helpful. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess it could be, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, as simple as a client coming into you and saying, somebody owes me £100,000, can you write a lawyer's letter to them demanding this payment? And the payment comes in and you send it on to the, the client. Um, and, you know, obviously that would be incredibly suspicious, but ca can money laundering be as simple as that? It certainly can. And that's, that's why in litigation, certainly, we would never just do that. Um, we're not in the business of just writing letters for people who want us to write letters. If somebody came in and said, this person owes us £100,000, then what we would need to do is see all the documentation relating to that debt um, to understand who that person was, to understand what their relationship was with the person who owes them the money. Um, and then, of course, we can write them a letter. If the money comes in, of course, very quickly, um, uh, which for those of us practicing debt recovery, you'll know is very unusual. Um, uh, but if it comes in very quickly, then obviously you've still got to be asking yourself, well, what, what's going on here? And is there something, is there something uh, amiss? But um, you, the important thing in that situation, and I think the important thing when you're discussing money laundering more generally is to understand the economic purpose and the legal purpose of, your, of what you're being instructed to do. It doesn't matter whether you're a corporate lawyer, commercial property lawyer, if you're dealing with um, trusts and private client, or you're dealing with a litigation or a debt recovery, like you've just suggested. Understanding the commercial purpose of the transaction or the, the instruction that you've been given is absolutely crucial. Um, so just don't do anything unless you unless you know what you're being asked to do and why. Yeah, and actually, just for the benefit of, of those in, in relocation businesses, I guess the equivalent would be to say, if you have a senior executive being relocated from Morgan Stanley from New York to London, that's one situation. But if you get somebody that contacts you from, uh, let's say, from Russia, and they say, please help me find a £5 million property in London, you know, the kind of checks and level of suspicion has to be so much higher in the latter case. Would that, that, that sound right? Y yes, and, and I think, well, the, the, the regulations and the Law Society, for example, will, will have a list of what they regard as high-risk jurisdictions. Um, and it's always important to, to bear in mind the risk of dealing with, with uh, clients in other jurisdictions because, for, first of all, you, you might not meet them. And second of all, they have different regulations and are held to different standards in some of uh, some of the parts of the world. Now, the way that we deal with it, Morton Fraser, which is not, which it goes over and above the way the money laundering regulations um, deal with it, is that we we regard um, uh, we say that anything out with the European Economic Area, uh, USA, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand are high risk jurisdictions right. because what we don't want to get into and what I don't want our staff to get into is making fine distinctions for example you know this somebody's somebody's we've got a client based in Paraguay and one in Venezuela well is Paraguay a higher risk jurisdiction than Venezuela yeah. why do you why we can't get into making that kind of fine distinction so I we've taken a very broad approach most of our clients are from these areas anyway from the you know from North America or Europe or um, or, or the United Kingdom so that's not a a big deal but if you're if you're dealing with someone out with these jurisdictions then as far as we're concerned that's a higher higher risk and it often means that you know it, it's often just a um a box ticking exercise in the sense that you have someone um from uh, a, a client from uh, you know south africa for example um or dubai as we often do um you know the only the only risk involved in the transaction might be the fact that they're in that jurisdiction and it's quite it's simple it's simple just to check and and, and tick it off and and you know approve the instruction but it's better doing that i think than than having 
us take on um, clients from these jurisdictions without visibility of it. Yeah, yeah. So going back to the sort of normal cases, a client, a new client comes in, what are the, the practical identity checks you carry out on a, a new client? Well, what, what we do uh, these days, um, Gordon, is we have a, a electronic verification software called Amicus, um, which is recommended by the Law Society. I think quite a lot of Scottish law firms are using that now. And Amicus is just a, 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 an email link, effectively. So um, what you need from the, the new person, that, the new client that comes in, is their, their name, their address, and an email address from them. And then you send them an amicus link and and through that link they verify their own identity so um it, it effectively means that they can sit at their desk in their house or in their office wherever they are and complete your id requirements um remotely and they can do it on any uh, device that's connected to the the, the internet so they can mm -hmm. uh, do it on their mobile phone if they want they can do it on a laptop or an ipad or whatever um, and they can do it from anywhere in the world it involves it involves uploading a a photograph of their passport and taking a, pic, a selfie with a, a unique code um, that they're they're sent through the through the link and it takes about ten minutes. Um, so it's a great um, it's a great thing for clients. It saves us a bit of time at, at um, uh, or fee earners a bit of time in in uh, dealing with it from Morton Fraser's end. But it saves clients a huge amount of time because before we we had that clients needed to come to the office to see us um, and give us physically give us their um, their ID. Um, or they needed to go to another regulated person, like another solicitor or a chartered accountant, uh, for example, and, and get their ID certified. So none of that anymore. They can do it all from their desk. And rather than traveling to Edinburgh and back and taking two hours, a two hour round trip or whatever, they, they can just sit at their desk and do it in 10 minutes, which is, which is great. There are obviously situations where we, we, the people aren't able to do it and particularly, um, elderly, more elderly, uh, People tend to, um, or, or occasionally find it difficult to use the, the, the amicus link. So, so we still need to verify their ID in the traditional way, which is getting two independent pieces of ID, um, one being a photo ID such as a, a passport or or driving license, and the other being proof of address such as a, a, mm -hmm. a government issued utility bill or something from HMRC, for example. And if they are. Um living abroad so if it's a, a french resident does the system work for that how, how do you deal with somebody who's a non-uk resident yeah the system works so there's a there's a different link that they're sent and they're asked to upload different documents but it's the same it's the same process okay. so again it it works um it works very well for all for all clients and indeed for companies if you're verifying the identity of a company and a beneficial owner again you're it, it can do both so um, and it does other checks as well for example we 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 have a check on whether the client's a politically exposed person because obviously as part of the money laundering regulations the or the anti-money laundering regulations that the um there's a focus on on uh, individuals who may be politically exposed in their own countries either because of the, they hold a public office or they're married to someone who does or they're related to someone who does um, and again uh, amicus can do that kind of check for you as well so it can it it it, it it can just check whether somebody is is on the the pep register yeah um i'm just thinking again in the context of the relocation industry um very often a new client would be an american relocation company so mm. again well i guess in the absence of let's say your uk relocation business you're new to anti-money laundering, so you've not signed up for a system along the lines you've, you've mentioned, Richard. Um, are there specific things you have to do for, let's say, a North American new client, a corporate new client, if, if you don't have that kind of system in place? Yeah, there's, there's, we certainly take a more um, in-depth approach to, uh, to client due diligence if we're dealing with a foreign company. Um, the main things for companies, though, wherever they're based, is to ensure that you have ID for um, a director of the company, at least one director, um, and that you you properly understand the structure and control of the, the organization. Um, and then that leads to the second 
important point of verifying the, the identity of a company, which is to make sure that you understand who, who the beneficial owner is of the company mm -hmm. or owners. Um, now, beneficial owner or owners for the purposes of the regulations is always an individual or individuals. It's somebody who owns more than 25% of the shares of the company or otherwise exercises control over the management and um, uh, of the company uh, or or, or whatever other co corporate entity you're dealing with, it may be a trust, for example, and it's somebody who controls the controls the company or controls the trust um, or partnership. Um, you know, it's really important, and I think that the, the beneficial owner checks are 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 really key because often the director that you're dealing with is is um, yes, he's the running of the company, but the person that you really need to make sure that you've verified is the is the person sitting right at the top of the tree. Yeah. Um, and 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 you know that can that can present challenges as well because obviously if you're dealing direct with if you're dealing with a large organization um, and you're dealing with a director or directors and quite often of course in in what I do in litigation you're dealing with a chief exec or a finance director for example and um, if you say then oh, I want to verify the the beneficial owner the beneficial owner may have absolutely no idea who you are or what the matter is that you're dealing with so you know sending them an amicus link out of the blue just isn't going to work um and it's about taking reasonable steps to um uh reasonable steps to verify their identity and understand the structure of the the organization you're acting for and that that can be that can be more challenging depending on the or the, the jurisdiction some jurisdictions have very tight money laundering controls like we do but in america it's pretty varied i think depending on what states mm -hmm. yeah your, your company's incorporated in and quite often, if you're dealing with companies from Delaware or other places in the States, it can be quite difficult to persuade them that uh, uh, money laundering or that compliance with the UK money laundering regulations is something they should care about. Yeah. Um, one, one aspect which uh, relocation firms will need to get their head around is suspicious activity reports. I wonder if you'd say a little bit about what that is and how you go about deciding that something is suspicious <laughs> in practice. Yeah, of course. So suspicious activity reports, I, I suppose it's almost the main function of a money laundering reporting officer to make sure that you're reporting any suspicious activity to the National Crime Agency. And um, the it, by suspicious activity, I, I'm talking about quite a low bar in the sense that what the the guidance is, is that you should be, anytime you have a reasonable suspicion that one of the offences under the Proceeds of Crime Act is taking place, then you should really be submitting a, a SAR to, to the NCA. And the offences under the Proceeds of Crime Act are, are um, in particular things like, um, things like I've just, just so it's in sections 327 to 329 of the Proceeds of Crime Act, you don't need to read the whole act because it's massive, but there's a very small section of the act which relates to money laundering. And um, so your um, facilitation of money laundering offences, for example, is something that, that needs to be reported if you feel that um, if you've got a reasonable suspicion that you're being asked to facilitate the money laundering offence or that you see facilitation happening, um, then you would have to report that to the, um, to the NCA. And the reporting requirement arises as a result of other sections of the, the Proceeds of Crime Act. So any person operating in the regulated sector has to submit a SAR um, in these circumstances. Um, for, for law firms, it's probably slightly different, and I suspect that um, you, you will end up having to submit more SARs than we do for a couple of reasons. First of all, some of what we do, at least in particularly litigation, for example, sits out with the regulated sector. So some of Morton Fraser's work, all the transactional work, for example, sits within the regulated sector. Litigation sits without, out with the regulated okay. sector. and um, so we do not have in litigation the same reporting requirements that um, that you would have, for example, in the financial services sector or indeed in other parts of the um, Morton Fraser. The other thing where, which impacts on law firms and again won't impact on, on you is that legal professional privilege comes into play. So, of course, we can't just go around telling whether it's law enforcement or anyone else everything that we know about our client's business. That would be a breach of the principles, common law principles of legal professional privilege. And there are privileged circumstances and exceptions in the Proceeds of Crime Act as well. So there are quite significant carve-outs from 
um, our reporting obligations and case law, indeed, in the House of Lords and, uh, for example, and the Supreme Court these days, which which discusses the um, the boundaries of the the or the difficulties that, that lawyers have, because of course, on the one hand, we've got this reporting requirement; on the other hand, we we can't breach privilege. So it's a difficult balance for mm. us. But for you, for you, and for anyone operating in the regulated sector, um, if you don't report. Um, when you have a reasonable suspicion of a money laundering offence being committed, then that's an offence in itself. So failing to report mm -hmm. is, is an offence. And as I say, it's a low bar because all you really need is a reasonable suspicion that an offence is being committed. And uh, the, the, the final thing I should say about that, Gordon, is when the, when the Proceeds of Crime Act was introduced, the, the definition of money laundering was deliberately um, made extremely wide. So if you look at the sections that I've mentioned in the Proceeds of Crime Act, it's effectively any financial crime. You know, if you if you there's there's very little that you would not have to report. So some of something like tax evasion, for example, um, would undoubtedly fall within um, within the, pro, the 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 terms of the, the act and and uh, trigger a reporting requirement. Yeah, and could that be as simple as a client, a new client, an individual um, who is very reluctant to provide you with evidence of identity or you know does it take a mix of circumstances for you to say well I'm unhappy about this I'm going to uh, uh, submit a report on it you know I, I, you've, you've talked about a low bar would that be enough just somebody you know not giving well, you there, evidence yeah there are there are there are two kinds of suspicious activity reports that you can submit. So you can submit one just for information only to the um, uh, to the NCA. So, for example, if you came across a, a client who, in the course of your dealings with them, it transpired that they had been involved in some tax evasion last year, um, uh, then you could submit what's called a, a, an information only SAR to the to the NCA, just telling them about what you've discovered. The other kind of SAR is a is a um, consent against money laundering, SAR, and what that involves is, is effectively getting the NCA's permission to act for this person, despite the fact that you have some concerns. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe the circumstances that we're talking about here. So we've, we, we know we'd, we would, um, in the past, we may have had to do that in relation to um, corporate transactions, for example, or, or um, you know, a client wanting to put, um, a client wanting to put all their assets into um, or, or transfer assets into a bear trust um, and us not really understanding why they're doing it and not being able to get a clear answer from them. Yeah. Well, you know, the one, one way of approaching that is to say to the NCA, um, this is the circuit, these are the circumstances, this is the client, this is what they're wanting to do. Um, you know, can we do it for them? Or, yeah. you know, and, and that's so, now that's not, as I say, that's not usually something that we would do because um, we would tend to consider that that, um, you know, we in these circumstances, I think it's better to, um, you, you're either, if you can't get satisfied yourself with economic purpose or the legal purpose of what you're doing, um, you've got to be asking whether or not you should be doing it at all. And we tend to take the view, well, if we can't, if we, if you can't explain to us why we're being asked to do this, then we're not doing it. Um, but, uh, but you certainly, you know, it's it, one approach is to, is to run these things past the NCA and get a consent uh, to act, and that can be um, uh, th that can be something that you you would do in in the sort of bigger corporate deals if there's a there's a hitch, for example, and you just need to get across the line. Yeah, and and I I mean just again in the context of relocation, my feeling would be in the vast vast majority of cases there's no problem because there's a clear purpose, which is somebody relocating and being relocated by their employer, you know, yeah. and it, it's a very clear cut. I guess the ones that relocation businesses will have to look out for will be the individual coming from a foreign country and, and, and wanting to buy here. And it's not exactly clear why they want to do that, but, uh, um, well, yeah. More uh, and and remember as well, I think that in these kind of situations, the other thing that will be really important and, and which um, we really hammer home to, to staff is to identify the source of wealth and source of funds of the, the person in question. Um, if they're buying property, 
you need to know where their money's coming from, um, you know, because that has, you know, their, if, if their money has come from an illegitimate transaction in their home country or an illegitimate business in their home country, then, you know, that's a money laundering offence. And, and you need to be clear. So you need to be clear, first of all, where their money's coming from, which may be as simple as getting uh, bank details from them or, or having, you know, insisting they set up a UK bank account, for example, for, for different, uh, for, for some purposes. Um, but source, source of wealth is really important as well. You need to know, you know, how these people um, establish their, their wealth. And again, that can be hard. You know, some mm -hmm. people object to, to, you know, being interrogated about where yeah. they got their money from. But, and, and, and often, and often in fairness that, you know, if um, I would, you can't underestimate the, the amount of information that's available on the web these days, you know, a Google search will, uh, I've had colleagues come to me before unable to satisfy themselves about source of wealth. But when you do a Google search, when you do a bit of interrogation about the person's life, you'll find out that, you know, 10 years ago, they were the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or something. You think, well, that would be where they got their money from. Yeah. So, you know, you can satisfy, there are ways of satisfying, you know, it's satisfying yourself as to these things, but it's about um, doing a bit of upfront work. And, and yes, it does take a bit of research at times and a bit of investigation, but if you don't do it and then it tra transpires that um, they got their wealth by, you know, selling guns in some part of the world, then, then that's a problem. So, yeah, that probably leads us on quite neatly to how you train staff. Um, so you're relying on your staff across your offices individually to be compliant. So how, how do you make sure that uh, what kind of practical training would you give to staff? I think the, the the first thing, and this is the most this is the most difficult part of it, because we obviously have you have your processes, um, and you can spend loads and loads of time putting good processes in place. But it's all for nothing if you can't actually persuade individual people to follow the processes. Um, so we do I I do yearly training um, for every division. So tailored training for each division in the firm. I do that personally. Um, we have a very detailed induction program for staff as well, so that when staff come into the firm, they are given really detailed training about um, uh, all of this kind of thing from a risk and compliance manager. Um, and we, <clears throat> more generally, um, the, I suppose what I try and do, or what I try and engender in, in staff at the firm is a, a feeling that this is their responsibility, because it is their responsibility. Um, you know, all too often at organizations, you see the, the attitude that, um, well, it's not my problem, this is the firm's problem, or this, you, we've, we've got a money laundering team, or this is our money laundering reporting officer's problem. Well, it, you know, certainly in, in, in accordance with the money laundering regulations and the Proceeds of Crime Act, this is a problem for every individual person who's acting in a regulated sector. And if they do something wrong, they'll be on the hook for it. So, and, and in the legal sector, if, you, if you're breaching the money laundering regulations as a solicitor, then that's a conduct issue. And the law society will mm. have a problem with you personally. I mean, yes, they'll have a problem with me as well by not, for not supervising it properly, but the, you know, the, the fee earner doesn't get away with it. So there's, a, there's part of it to, um, which I think is, is really, trying to hit home to them that this is an everyday part of their job and they have to do it right. There's, there's um, and we, uh, I've set up a team for that purpose. So the team, the money laundering team at the firm is myself, the operations director, um, our risk and compliance manager. And then I have a, a money laundering champion effectively in each division, um, which runs more regular, who runs more regular training for, for the staff in each division or can address questions, divisional questions as they arise. So specific corporate questions, for example, or specific uh, trust questions and private client. And having a bigger, having a team like that, I think is really important because at an organization the size of ours, it's really very hard for one or two people to yeah. deal with everything or deal with all the queries that arise. Um, so training is done on a sort of ongoing basis, but there's formal yearly training as well. Um, and I think that I think that the 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 other important thing when it comes to compliance is is to make is accountability. People have to understand that that you know they'll be accountable for not doing it. Um, and you know we have we have sanctions 
internally for people who don't who are regular uh, non or non compliers with the um, with our money laundering procedures. Now that's very very rare that we ever have to do anything about that, um, but we have done in the past and, and no doubt we will do again in the future. But you know, there, so training's part of it, but the other part of it is is accountability. And 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 the message I try and get across to everybody is that um, you, you know don't don't think that you can just say well this is the problem for the money laundering team because yeah. um, the law society and um, uh, you know and, and indeed the police and others will consider that it's an individual responsibility yeah yeah well, that's a very important point um finally let me just ask you about record keeping because again i know that in the relocation sector one of the big fears is an hmrc audit so i just wondered from what are the basic records you need to keep i mean i, I mean, presumably you start with training records have to be maintained but across the board what uh, what do you well, ensure is in place yeah well we need a firm wide risk assessment and and um and obviously um we have we have procedure documents one is a document that's called aml procedures one is a document which is customer due diligence procedures and they're all these documents are to be read together they're on they're made available to staff on the our intranet um and everyone is encouraged to read them and they're available to anyone if the law society for example comes in to audit us and they can see that that these are these documents are are up there um i in relation to in relation to the other records that we have um we obviously have records of um we we can get quite a lot of detailed reporting information from our our uh, uh, uh case management system so we you know we regularly audit files because one of our um one of the requirements under the the regulations is that we we continually audit um uh, audit individual files now that's a difficult job and that's part of the reason why we have a, a a reasonably sized team because um even if you're auditing um a handful of files a quarter um that's a big commitment if you're if if they if they're bigger files um and one of the ways in which we we deal with uh, auditing files is we pull off information from the um the system which shows us um whether at the client level we've got all the right information we've done things like client risk assessments etc um at the matter level we've you know got all the right information for the matter we've done matter risk assessments um so we can pull all that information off and we can get a list very easily of um uh, where these things are outstanding how long they've been outstanding for and um, uh, and that gives us real insight into into targeting areas in the business, for example, where we feel that there needs to be a bit more diligence in, mm -hmm. in money laundering um, uh, compliance. And again, and you know, and if the law society were to come in to audit us and ask say, and to say to us, well, can we have a list of your um, can we have a list of files, for example, where there is an outstanding client risk assessments? We could just provide them with that list immediately. Um, now that would be a small list, and hopefully we'd only go back a week or, or two because they would be dealing with ones that we're waiting for um uh, for from uh, you know for new clients um but if there are any historic ones on that list then obviously you can you can easily drill down into it and find out what the reason for that is and very often very often the reason is that the matter's not proceeded or it just needs to be closed etc and it's not a non-compliance issue it's more a procedural thing but that for us that really um that's really important to be able to distinguish between where you've got issues which are simply procedural and you need to um uh, you need to improve your procedure or issues which are substantive in the sense that yeah. there's a there's a problem with money laundering compliance you need to be able to 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 easily find that information um and so in terms of record it, in terms of uh, record keeping that's really important for us and then finally yes we do have um we keep records of all the training um that we do um i would tend to upload my yearly training onto the internet as well so that people can uh you know it's compulsory so they should be at the sessions anyway but if it's not if they can't come for one reason or another then they can watch it on um uh, on the internet um, and we have uh, other um uh, uh, other areas to store information for example we have a file on law society supervision so um a few years ago we were audited in the trust and company service um 
sorry, I don't know if my headphones have cut out there, but we, we were audited in the trust and company service um, uh, area um, a few years ago, and we've got in detailed records of, of that investigation and, uh, you know, and, and any other law society supervision that we're, we're involved in. Okay, and just at a very basic point, would I be right in thinking that until you have carried out initial checks and completed the checks on a new prospective client, you wouldn't start work for them? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I think that's, the, that's almost the most crucial aspect of it, that um, uh, you, you cannot start work for any new client. And we make it clear to all staff that they cannot start work for any new client until they've gone through the money laundering checks. And we just make that clear to clients right at the right at the outset, saying to them, you know, once you've completed our amicus link, once you've gone through the compliance process, we'll issue you with terms of business and then start work. But um, or or you can issue terms of business first and then go through the amicus link and and etc. But the um, yeah, you we would certainly never undertake any substantive work for a client prior to to going through the money laundering checks. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point to end on uh, for, again, relocation firms new to this. You do get pressure, of course, from clients to start the home search or whatever it happens to be. But the answer is no, you're, you're really getting into dangerous territory unless you've completed and the identity checks. Now. Absolutely. And, and if somebody, if a, client is, um, if a client is resistant to completing the identity checks, um, then, then you know, going back to the, our requirement to submit SARS to the NCA, um, does, do, does their resistance to complete an identity check lead to a reasonable suspicion that, uh, that there's something wrong? Yeah. Um, it may well do. It may not. It may just be a, an obstinate person who doesn't like going through these things. But, <laughs> but, but, but it, you, you need to be thinking about that and asking yourself whether that's the, um, whether there's a good reason for it, or whether it's just, um, whether it makes it uh, uh, suspicious. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, you've brought enormous clarity to what is, is a difficult area and of course a, a relatively new area for relocation businesses. So, so thank you very much for that. Not at all, thank you, Gordon. Um, and, and thanks to everyone uh, for, for watching this and I, I'm, uh, I'm sure um, you've all learned a great deal from it uh, and um, as, as part of, of this course. And there are two further interviews um, uh, later on in, in this module. Um, so, bye for now.